Good morning and Merry Christmas. This is your annual reminder that the season of Christmas is indeed a season. We have the, the 12 days of Christmas that run until January 6th, the season of Epiphany. So please keep the Christmas lights lit. We are still in this uh, time when we're uh, thinking through what it means to uh, live as people who follow uh, someone, a God who loves us enough to come to be born amongst us. Uh, this particular Sunday, the 27th, uh, is a Sunday that the Missouri Conference, uh, it, knowing that the pastors of, of, of the state have been pushing pretty hard since March, uh, wanted to make sure they had the ability to take a Sunday off. Uh, just to let you know, if um, if it looks like it's easy to put together a video and, and keep it posted and do all the necessary back-end stuff, it actually... Uh, almost doubles the amount of time it takes to get stuff ready for Sunday. And so we have been sent uh, a, a video of a sermon given by Reverend Bruce Baxter to be able to share. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to be doing is um, taking this Sunday, the 27th. I'm actually not going to take the Sunday off. What I'll be doing is taking the time to look at the Sundays down the road because Easter is just it's just over the horizon. It's coming. And I'm uh, excited to be able to share this with you because Bruce Baxter is someone who I deeply respect and admire. He is a, <clears throat> when I moved to Missouri 15 years ago, graduated from seminary, I moved uh, at the beginning of January. And when I landed, I, uh, there was no promise I'd have a church. Uh, they, I could Go, come to Missouri, but the Missouri Conference didn't necessarily have to take me. And, and so I, I moved uh, to Missouri, and, and I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And Bruce worked at the conference office, and, and I don't know if he remembers this, but he was one of the people who stopped and, and took the time. We went out to lunch at uh, El Maguey, one of the Mexican places down in Colombia, and he helped me understand how the conference works and helped me uh, get down the path that, that I'm now on today. And so I, I'm very thankful to, to Bruce for the, this, the ways he, he has helped me. And, and so uh, Bruce Baxter is a DS, the district superintendent in the southern part of the state. And, and so it's well, with some real joy. And I, I join you in looking forward to hearing what uh, Reverend Baxter is going to be sharing with us on this Sunday. Again, Merry Christmas, and I look forward and hope to see you soon. It is a joy to speak to you today. Thank you, Colin, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, boy, it has been a year. I bring you greetings from our bishop, Bishop Bob Farr. His office is in Columbia, and he presides over all the United Methodist churches in Missouri. I am one of nine district superintendents. Our bishop has been here in the district often. He knows and loves the United Methodist churches of Missouri. So for me, I've been in this office now for three and a half years, and it is a privilege to be able to resource the pastors and uh, the churches. We have 74 churches, 58 pastors, and uh, God is at work among us. And uh, this has been a year none of us could have imagined, and a year some people have said it's the longest year we've ever lived through. <laughs> now, maybe in recent memory. But as we come to this part of the year, I would declare that I want to finish well. Not just this year, but life. I want to finish well. Some of you are looking and saying, well, Bruce, you're probably closer to the end than, than many of us. <laughs> and I would say that's probably true. Um, but you know, I didn't always have this white hair. I, uh, I remember back to when I was 27, had dark brown hair. I probably even had a beard. And I was a new pastor and I visited one of our members. Her name was Mrs. Beeneman. Now she was 99 years old. We had a great visit. As I left her house, I remember thinking to myself, if I live to be 99 years old, I'm gonna look back on my life and I'm gonna think, man, it went fast because that was Mrs. Beeneman's reflections. And I determined that I was gonna even be more intentional about how I live my life because if I live long, it will seem like it went by fast. And if I don't live very long, that's even more reason to be intentional. Well, before I was 27, I remember back when I was 25. I was in seminary and I, I, was, I finished a marathon with a friend of mine from seminary. We ran the Mother's Day Marathon in Columbus, Ohio. And as we were gathering our things up and getting ready to, uh, to head back home, 
this uh, fella came across the finish line and I learned that he was 70 years old. And I thought to myself, 70 years old, finishing a marathon. I wonder if anybody has, has ever run a marathon in every decade of their life from their 20s on up. And I set out to do that. So one of the ways I have marked the passage of the decades is I trained for and run a marathon in each one. The one I did in my 60s was the hardest one. I did the Detroit Marathon. And oh, I think I cried as I finished. It was the hardest. But I have one more to go. So at 25, I was picturing being 70, and I'm getting close. Back when I was 20 years old, I was a, a commuter college student living at, my, at home with my parents, and a church, United Methodist Church, asked me to come and to speak. It was nice to have a college student who was religious, as they would have said, and so uh, I did. And as I looked out on that congregation, and I realized they were typical United Methodist folks, I remember saying to them, as I think about life, I said to this congregation, I don't want to simply finish my education, get a job, get married, have kids, retire, and die. I said at that point, I want my life to be meaningful. Now, turns out, I did finish my education, got a job, worked for a CPA firm for a while, married Audrey, we've had a couple of kids, and now retirement's out there, and, um, and then death. But at the age of 20, I saw that life needs to be intentional and lived with purpose. I didn't always feel that way. I'll go back just a few more years. When I was 17, I was a senior in high school, and um, there was something I did not finish well. I'd been a Boy Scout all of my life. I, as a child, I was in a, a Cub Scout den, and then at 12, I joined the Boy Scouts, worked through all the merit badges, went to summer camp every year, did the service projects, and in my senior year, I was 17, was, had a girlfriend, I was driving a really, really great 1968 Mercury Cougar with a 302 in it, and, um, and I had a foreign exchange student. I decided I do not need to, to finish this Eagle Scout Award. I said to my parents, I don't think I'm going to finish the project or the merit badges. They were disappointed, but they wisely said, Bruce, this is your decision. And I said, yeah, I, I don't need to finish that. The year rolled around, I turned 18. That was the cutoff for when you could finish that, uh, that work. And then I, as I became a, a young adult and then as I became a pastor, whenever I, I'm involved in an Eagle Scout ceremony, they always say, would everyone here who's an Eagle Scout please stand? And I always have to remain seated. I did not finish well. And I've used that in my own mind to be a reminder that it's possible to not finish well, but from this point forward, I want to finish well. My hope is that your experiences during this past year have helped you take a different, different look at your own life. I mean, this has been a year we did not expect. When we were getting ready to celebrate New Year's Eve Going into 2020, we, were, we had no idea how this year would play out. I hope this year has, has helped you to think about your life in a different way. Because, you know, it is so easy just to proceed through life. When I was 20, I didn't want to do this. I saw so many people just going through life. It's easy just to keep on going until, boom, you hit something. Maybe some sort of failure, some sort of loss. Maybe some sort of brokenness. And then it causes you to think about life. I would hope that, that this, uh, this year, this pandemic has given each of us pause to think about life. Because we know this, uh, this life is not all there is. And this pandemic has reminded us that, um, that we are mortal. Sometimes people have this experience in what we call midlife. They get to the middle of their life, maybe in their 40s, and they realize they, they hit the subtotal button, they look to where they are, and they're either pleased or disappointed, and they make adjustments. I think each of us have an opportunity here at the end of the year to consider the adjustments that would help us to finish well. In the passage that uh, we're reading today comes from the Apostle Paul. He, uh, it's his second letter to Timothy, probably the last letter that he wrote that would become Scripture, and Timothy is his young protege, one who came to know Christ under Paul's ministry and then was called into the ministry with Paul. And so Paul, um, Paul said this. He said, the time of my departure has come. 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I love it that, uh, that Paul expresses this in his letter to Timothy. This is like a conversation in writing. Paul uses the term, he says, my departure has come. Now, the Greek word that we translate into English, departure, was a word that had a few nuances. One of those nuances was, this is the word you would use if you were taking down your tent. So if you were getting ready to take down your tent, you would use this word. And in many ways, the tent is a good metaphor for us because this body is like a tent. This is not our final or permanent home. Another metaphor, another nuance of this word uh, in Greek would be if you were on shore and you watched people throwing the lines off of a ship that was about ready to set sail, you would use this word, this Greek word meaning departure. So the apostle Paul, as he talked about the end of his life, he didn't, he didn't use the word finality. He talked about it as a, a departure, a leaving. In fact, in another letter, he even defined more carefully what, uh, what he understood life to be. In his letter to the Philippians, he said this, it is my eager expectation and hope that, that Christ will be exalted now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. He said this, he said, for me, living is Christ and dying is gain. I love it that Paul stated that dying is gain. He did not say that it was loss, it was gain. Well, fortunately, we are not there yet. I don't know any of us who are under a sentence of, uh, of death in prison. There are people around the world like that. Some of us have longer to live than others, but none of us know. But we're not there yet. We got time. And my hope is that, uh, that we can consider what we want to do with the time that we have. You know, we think we're gonna live maybe 70 or 80 or more years. We do life expectancy tables. We think about that. But really, with this COVID pandemic, we've come to realize that people will die at all different ages. It is so tragic that people have died this year who were very young. The people have died who were middle-aged. People have died who were elderly but healthy. And so we begin to think, what is this? I recognize that once a person is old enough to understand that people die, there can be this fear of death that is paralyzing. It's something that you, you don't want to think about. You know that, that, yes, death happened, but you don't want to think about it. Now, there's a healthy fear of death that keeps you from doing risky behavior and putting yourself in circumstances that, that, are, that, are, that are dangerous. But there's this nagging fear of death that I think cripples us in which we can have a victory over. Paul was not nagged by the fear of death. So I'm going to ask you at this point, just wherever you are, to think about your life. Do a little self-examination. Where are you? If you were adding up, what, what does the display read? How are you doing? Are you pleased with, with your relationships, with your, uh, with your vocation, with your choices? Do you feel that your walk with God is, where, is, is in a good place? I have good news for you. No matter where you find yourself, at this point, at the end of the year, there is promise that you can, you can experience the grace of God and that you can, you can undergo some new life wherever you are. So as you think about finishing well, I encourage you to think about the end. Look, what would the end of your life look like if you do finish well? For Mrs. Beneman, it was being at home, welcoming folks, encouraging people, sharing her life story to build people up. That's how she finished well. When we do a project, we picture what's it gonna look like at the end. So what does your life look like at the end? What do you need to do in the next few days? What do you need to do to, um, to finish well? I would say that, um, that uh, the sky is a limit. We have lots of opportunities, lots of possibilities. There's a book in the Bible that could have been written in 2020. It was really written a long time ago. The prophet Jeremiah wrote it, and it's got an unusual name. We call this book the Book of Lamentations. And uh, the Book of Lamentations is Jeremiah's 
recording his thoughts and feelings after his city, Jerusalem, was torn down and his people were hauled off into slavery. And he lamented and he expressed this sense of loss. We in, uh, in our culture have not been really good with lament. We often just try to, to cover over loss, cover over disappointment, just sort of, you know, keep on going. This year, we've turned our attention, many have, to how could we properly lament? How can we express this grief as a process that we've gone through? But in the middle of this lamentation, the prophet Jeremiah, trusting completely in God, says this. He says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And this is in the midst of a great tragedy for the people of God. He says, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, and therefore I will hope in him. Hope. What a great, uh, a great image of viewing the future. I had a conversation a couple weeks ago with my insurance agent. I was talking to him about, about a, uh, one of our policies, and as we chatted, he said, Bruce, he said, one of the most fulfilling things I've been able to do over the last few years, he said, I've been trained as a chaplain to work where there's been a, a, a catastrophic destruction. He said, some people come in with their chainsaws and with their bulldozers and help clean up the rubble. He says, my wife and I have been trained to come in and to meet with people and to help them think about their life, to examine their life, to see what's happening. And he says, if we've done this in many places, he says, I observe that often the people I'm meeting with no longer have any hope and they no longer expect to have any joy. He said his goal is to help people find hope and to anticipate that there will be joy again. Think about this. When Jesus was pressed in his earthly ministry, people said, what is the most important commandment? And he said, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. I believe that if we, if we work towards fulfilling that first commandment, to love the Lord our God, with all of our mind, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, that will cause hope to rise up inside of us. We love God when we, when we pray. We love God when we sing songs of worship. We love God when we open the scripture and read and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts the divine truths of eternity and of who God is, and as we learn about our own lives and the sinfulness and the peace that passes understanding through Jesus Christ. So I encourage you, as you think about your life, work to, to do everything you can to love the Lord your God with everything within you, and you will find that hope will rise. A second way to, uh, to live is to, is to love the Lord our God and to love the people around us as ourselves, our neighbors, the people in proximity. Jesus encouraged his followers to invest their lives in others, to serve other people. Jesus himself did this, you remember. He washed his disciples' feet, the lowest job of all the servants, near the end, so they, they would see that he served them and they were to serve others. I have an image that I have kept in my mind over the last several years that that our lives could be likened to a wicker basket. And this wicker basket is full of water that continues to run into it. And, um, and this wicker basket leaks. And we could, we could mistakenly spend our life trying to, to patch all the, the gaps in the wicker basket so it wouldn't leak and we could save all that water. But that is a fruitless endeavor. In fact, if you try to save all the water in your wicker basket, you're going to eventually lose it. A better approach is recognizing that life is flowing out of us is to determine where we're going to allow that basket to leak. And I would encourage us to let our baskets leak into the lives of others. 
by serving other people, by, by being with other people in their need, by loving people, by forgiving people, allowing our, our life to flow into other people is a beautiful way to express our love for God. I would hope that, that my wicker basket is carefully arranged throughout my life so that it flows into other people. Now there's a man who did this extremely well. His name is Bob Buford. He was born in, um, in Oklahoma in the 1930s. Uh, his mom and dad had a radio station and then they moved to Texas and his dad was kind of sickly and his dad died when Bob was really young. But his mom was a businesswoman ahead of her time. She, um, she bought a television station and then she bought some cable outlets and Bob went through, uh, went through school. He said that when he was a kid, his mom didn't read nursery rhymes to him. She read profit and loss statements to him. She gave him a briefcase when he was 12. And then he went on to college and studied business and uh, was in line to run the family business um, as he got older and understood it better. But tragedy struck and his mother died in a fire when he was only 32. And he inherited the business and all of the complexity. And he applied himself and he worked hard and he had a plan and he asked people to help him. Peter Drucker was one of the ones he, he asked to help him. But over the next 10 years, he, he grew his company by 25% every year. He bought uh, other cable outlets and radio stations, uh, TV stations in these small to medium markets until he had this conglomerate pulled together. And in his mid-40s, Bob Buford realized he had achieved every goal he had set. He'd made all the money he would ever need. And he decided that the best use of the rest of his life was to encourage other people, to pour his life into the life of others. So he started a, an organization called the Leadership Network, and he poured his financial resources and his, his understanding of, of, of leadership into that group and raised up pastors and uh, business leaders, community leaders. He wrote a book called Halftime, just about this time in which you begin to examine your life. And then, uh, then he wrote a book called Finishing Well. And... Uh, he himself was a man who finished oh so very well. Now, the, the father of our tribe, the man we look to in history who, who poured his life into others was a man named John Wesley. He was a priest in the Church of England. God used him in the, in the Methodist movement of the 1700s. He lived a long time for his generation. He was born in 1703 and he died in 1791. During his life, he would often pay attention to how it was that people died. Someone would say that Mrs. Um, Mrs. Smith has died, and he would say, tell me about it. What were her last days like? He did this because he, he was sure that a person's faith impacted how they felt about death and how they died. In fact, as John Wesley, as an elderly man, was losing strength, he called his closest associates around him, and he said this to them. He said, the best of all, God is with us. And they couldn't quite understand him. So he got a little more strength. He said it again. The best of all, God is with us. I would say, as we end this year, the best of all, God is with us. The future lies ahead. It is uncertain. We don't have any idea what the future holds, but we know that God holds the future and as we worship and cultivate our love for God, hope rises. And as we pour our lives into the lives of other people, we will experience joy. I encourage you, as you think about what lies ahead, to seriously reflect upon your life and to do some work determining what it is God is calling you to do. What is it God is impressing upon your mind? Who are the people that God is giving you a burden for so that in the coming days and months and in the new year, you can pour yourself into other lives and see the hand of God working through you to bring life to others. Truly, God is good. We are a people called by his name and we will serve him no matter what. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this past year with all that it has held. Lord, we know that you are Lord and you have given us your mercy and your grace. Lord, we pray that you would guide us as we feel the impact of this year in our own lives. 
Guide us as we imagine how you are leading us forward. Guide us, Lord, as we run the race in our lives that you have set before us and help us, Lord, to look to you because you are the author and finisher of our faith. And Lord, we pray that you would sustain us in every way as we aim, like Paul, to finish well to that time in which our departure is at hand. We love you, Lord. We thank you for life. We thank you for our friends, for our church, for our families. And Lord, we commit all that lies ahead to your lordship and to your will. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.